<laughs> All right, we are here. First episode the, of the Federal Files with my friend Jack Riley and my friend Joe Cronin. And uh, a little something we're going to, a little something extra we're going to try to bring you guys once a month or so. Uh, we are down here at the Colombo studio in uh, Dogtown, St. Louis. Uh, we appreciate uh, their hosting our studio, and uh, that's always good. We've um, had a lot of beers here over the years. Um, so, uh, th and before we get to the border, and uh, we're going to talk about the border and all the uh, chaos that it, it comes from it um, as our main topic today. But before we get started, um, I just want to give us a little background on how we all uh, know each other. And I work for Jack uh, and Joe at DEA from uh, 2003 to 2009. Um, Jack uh, was our uh, assistant special agent in charge yeah. at the time. Yeah. And Joe was an agent at the time, but he got promoted and he became my uh, supervisor at DEA. That was classic. And uh, we had a lot of fun. And uh, one of the things that uh, was special, and we always talk about this, is the friendship that we, we over the years. No question. Um, and we, and, and just like the, the regular podcast that we have on Mondays, um, this is just going to be us just sitting down and talking about stuff that interests us. Um, probably won't be as much uh, ribbing as uh, we give each other on the other podcast, but I'm eh, sure there'll be, <laughs> there'll be some. You never know. There'll be some. And before I and they get sick of my voice, Jack, just, just tell them a little bit about your career, uh, how it started and where you've been. I, uh, I came on a job in uh, the early 80s in Chicago as a street agent, um, endured 13 transfers, and uh, ended up being the number two in charge of DEA uh, upon my retirement in uh, 2017. That's a perfect description. And Joseph, how well, about you? Well, I can't do the 13 transfers, and he always brings that up. So I did seven, I think, but we'll go from there. So I came out of Chicago as well as Jack did. My first duty assignment was here. I spent about mm, nine or ten years here and then went out to... Washington, D.C., worked in the Special Operations Division and a terrorist group out there called Sintoc, and then went out, did some work with Jack in Chicago when he was the special agent in charge of Chicago. He left one, that one out. That was, that was a really good yeah. time for all of us when he, was, when he was that boss. So I did some work for him in Springfield, and then when Jack went back to be the number two, I went back and, and did some work for him at Special Operations Division. Some, some and, did, really and did great Really great work. You guys have had some cool assignments after St. Louis, but uh, we'll, we'll credit St. Louis with the start of it all, correct? I, There's no question. There's I a, think so. Hey, this is the best police department in the world I've ever worked with, and I really mean it, and I've been all over the place. So uh, I, I'm thrilled to be here. And We had a special and, relationship with you did. guys, and, and, and Joe and Jack were very, very supportive of task force officers. And they were very supportive of their agents, but they really took us task force agents and then uh, really made us feel at home um, that we were part of the team. And, 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 we, and, and we, I think you guys did some special things with the St. Louis area as far as that relationship went with the task force officers and the police departments that sent guys down there and other police departments. Yeah, um, yeah I think one of the things that I really like about St. Louis is when I left in 2010-ish, uh, I always judged St. Louis as what, it was like compared to where I grew up in Chicago and the police department in Chicago, which is an excellent police department. I have some cousins on that department and some other family members, typical union town type stuff. And St. Louis is a very, very close second. So when I left DC, the number one place I wanted to come back to was, was St. Louis. And it's been, I've been here since 2017 after I retired and it, it's been a ton of fun. Right. And then to both of you guys left for a long period of time, not a long period of time, but Five plus years, both of you left yeah. after St. Louis, and you ended up both re relocating back here. Joe, you never moved. I know Jack, you and Monica moved a, a several different times, but you ended up back here. Absolutely, and I, I was telling Joe when we pulled up, I haven't been to Columbus in 17 no, years. No, so I'm hoping that the statute of limitations is kind of. <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't that crazy. Hey, well, it, I'll tell you one thing about Columbus that I love is it's like every great corner bar in Chicago. It is it's the just, best. It's a fantastic place. The ambiance upstairs is nice. The people are fantastic. <laughs> yeah. The beer was always ice cold. The food was off the charts. Yep. And I'm a giant pizza snob. And I, if I remember right. The pizza was pretty damn tasty, yeah, too. Yeah. So Pizza good, is good here. Uh, unfortunately, the days of driving 30 miles are pretty much over, right. but it was, uh, it was always, always a good time. And it's, it's good to be back. And I remember this basement very well. 
But one of the things that um, you guys, and we're having our show tomorrow, I told you guys we're going to do it on the MVOP. Yeah. And uh, so, and that, and Jack, you and Joe Speece worked closely. Yeah, no. Of I, working to put those violence units together back in like 2003. Yeah. And, um, and you sent me to there. And, uh, and well, then, that, that was a great move. And Joe Speece is one of the best police executives I've ever been around. And I think at that time, St. Louis. And DEA, uh, we needed each other for a lot of reasons. And guess what? We pulled it off. We did it. And and you guys really made an impact. And uh, that's one of the things I'm really most proud of. In every other office and city that I've been in and offices I've ran, I've insisted, hey, we got to do the experiment that we did in St. Louis because it really worked. And and I, uh, for me, it was a home run. really was. We had a lot of Thank fun. you for that. I, I completely- and Joe was our uh, supervisor. He was our supervisor at the time. And um, it was neat because the group that we were in at DEA was also called the uh, Violent Offenders Unit. Right. And the, the um, unit in the police department was called the Violent Offenders right. Unit, and we worked a lot together. We did. Even though you guys sent me out there to do a lot of my work, but I worked closely with you guys, too, on working longer-term um, federal cases, which um, are some of the cases that we'll be talking about uh, in the future. We're going right. to talk about the border today. But, Joe, tell them a little bit about what else we're going to talk about um, and what else we're going to do on some of these Federal Fridays. Well, I, I think what's really good about the Federal Friday side, and I'm glad we talked about this, so the last podcast we did, Jack and I both got a lot of responses about, hey, we'd like to hear a little bit more about some of the international stuff. We'd like to hear a little bit more about some of the really neat cases and then how you draw them back to cities or like St. Louis or even other people, other task force officers. So we're going to try and talk about the BMF on an international type scale. We're going to talk about some terrorist cases, some groups associated with the Mexican cartels, which we'll brief about today. We're going to talk about some fun stuff that DEA used to do overseas that always came home. So Jack and I were very unique in in our careers. And I mean, he saw it from the top, but we were able to see it from both sides. So we got to see it from the local side, which we did. And we got to see it from a a bigger side at DC, but then we also got to see it and how it affects international. So, I mean, that's... For me, and it was a drop the mic moment in 2017. I knew I had a house out in DC, and we were we're at that. Jack talk. Jack and I talk about this all the time. We've been friends forever. Uh, you know, you you should have stayed. You should have done this. You should have done that. But when 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 we were about to say it's time to go, I knew I would never have a job like that again, and I would never be exposed to anything like that again, and it would never be as operational. So I was like, you know what? This might be a good time. I mean, there's some family issues there. My daughter was going to high school, and we kind of were separate for four or five years, but uh, my daughter and my wife, so it was time to get, to get back. But uh, I am blessed to have had that opportunity, and I will never forget it. And we stay up on this stuff all the time. We have a couple things since your last podcast that are going through some production companies, and it's kind of on a bunch of stories that we have as well. So we'll talk about those more as they develop. But what a wonderful time. And I always consider myself the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. So a book from the old days that I think we had to read. Yeah. Well, it's an old movie with Bing Crosby. You realize no one reads books. (laughs) Come on. That flew right over my ass. It was... It was uh, a dream for me to get on with DEA, and we talked about this in your last podcast. It was a complete dream for me to get on, and it took me six years, so talk about trying to really stick through it. And then when I got on, it it was tough at first. I was like, oh, did I make the right decision? There was a lot of different issues associated with with being a police, I was never a policeman before. I was a geologist and did some work. I stopped. Oh, I know. Yeah, I I used to be a fairy, you know. <laughs> no, but whatever. Yeah, but, what kind uh, of rock this is? You it was. Much oh, I we care. used to do that yeah. all the time. We driving down uh, tw- Highway 21, yep. and then it's cut out of the mountains, right? And Joe's like, "Oh, you know what kind of rock this is?" I go, "You just don't understand how much I don't care." <laughs> I know. But <laughs> was, I, so a little digression here. If you don't realize, there's uh, oh, there's we. granite, sedimentary. And old caves and volcanoes all over Missouri. So it's an amazing stuff. Red Rock, or not Red Rocks, it's called Elephant State Rocks. Okay. And, and all these beautiful places, tons of fossils. Du- duly to noted, Joe. Yeah, it is. So I, <laughs> I will get, get off, I will get off that. <laughs> we'll, we'll save the podcast about we rocks for you. I don't think <laughs> I don't museum, think you can do a side shoot. Series. <laughs> I don't think that one will go well. But just, just, and I'll end it with, with something about St. Louis that, that I really enjoy. We met... Gosh, 
I, I remember meeting you in the gym when you just got back from Vegas. That was back in the day. Yeah, back in the day. And I was trying to get Dan Sweeney on. So I was politic. I didn't know you. And you said to me right there, you go, yeah, he's not getting on. I am. And I was like, man, that sucks. Because Dan and I were, were dear friends. We had just done a, a case that had a ton of local impact, but also had some political corruption. Yeah, and that brought that. us together on some other things that we talked about the other day. But you and I became lifelong friends. And it's been it's as been we a all dream. have, and that's you know like it, we emphasize that on the other podcasts. It's just the friendships you make over right. that. And you guys have done it with agents too. Um, I know we stay close with a lot of other agents, and unfortunately, with your guys, the way you guys move around, a lot a lot of people end yeah, up end here, up but they end up elsewhere. But yeah. you guys still get to stay in touch with them. But one of the things that we said in the last podcast, but Jack, um, you've really taken care of Joe over the years, yeah. God, um, yeah. and we call it riding the coattails. But in, in, in return, Joe's done a pretty good job for you and, and tell some of the places that you put him in, in Washington. Well, I, I think that's, that's part of maturing as a, a boss is understanding the capabilities of the people that work for you. And Joe, every time I'm, uh, I put him in a place, he's answered the call and kicked some ass. And, and I, I really appreciate, as I did with you guys and the PD, the uh, just kind of the urgency in which you guys work, yeah. where you get what the problem is and uh, you, you're going to get it done. And I think if you look across the federal government, certainly the, the crew in Congress that I had to deal with, that's unheard of. So uh, law enforcement in general is kind of like the elephant in the room. We want to get it done. This is not, you know, this is not that hard. Right. It's not rocket science. And I, I appreciate what Joe did, especially at Special Operations. That's something that's very close to me. I, I was one of the first agents helped start it uh, back in the mm -hmm. late 80s. And uh, to see it go to where it is now, the centerpiece of uh, federal law enforcement, at least in my mind, a multi-agency, multi-international agency uh, crew, and Joe was, was kind of the linchpin of getting it to the next level. And I, uh, I, I can't say mm -hmm. enough. And I think that's one of the, and you guys working there in the Fusion Center, you started the Fusion Center too, and you were very involved with that. And it, it gives a different insight, like we're going to talk about the border today. You guys bring a big a different in, insight to that because you know, a lot of people just talk about the border, what they see in the paper, or different things like that. And, and we're really going to, um, getting into the border is, is one of the things Joe wanted to start out with was, what is the border? You know, what are some of the facts of the border? When you talk about the borders, I mean, okay, it's an imaginal line that you, know, you got to come in through certain areas. But what are some of the things, Joe, that are interesting about the, uh, the border itself? So I think, I think the greatest thing about the border is we're not going to touch too much about the north, north side border. we got a couple little things about that, which is, boy, if you're sneaking through the north side border, you're a pretty serious sneaker, so to speak, right? So that's, that's in the great northwest, which is probably the easiest way to cross it or through some other port of entry, but that's, that's a little bit more devastating. And right now we wanna really focus on the s southern border. And the reason we wanna do that is because it's, it is wide open for business. And we're gonna try and stay as far away from politics as we can, but it's wide open for business and it's had the cartels explode. Now they've always been what they've been and they became international, which we're gonna talk about as well and some of the convergence they have with some of the terror groups and the money situations. But right now, it, it's, it's serious, and it's a scary dynamic. And, and I don't think the pundits on TV talk about the management of the border in a way they turn it into politics, and I just think that that's, that's right. I think to follow up on that is I was the agent in charge of about a third of the Mexican border when I was in El Paso. And to go to the view that people have, mm -hmm. my neighbors have, you have, yes. it, it, it's ill-conceived to begin with. First of all, the border is nearly 2,000 miles long on the southern end, and much of it is desolate. And on the Mexican-U.S. sides, you don't even know you're in Mexico or you're in the no. United States. Um, and that's ripe for law enforcement not being able to control it. And certainly we know, and I know, having been there, uh, on the border and on the Mexican side, there's just not a lot of good guys. No. Uh, so organized crime, which has such a foothold in Mexican law enforcement and the government, 
uh, really has a playground uh, to make it happen. And I think it's important for people to understand that. I'll tell you this story, and I won't mention his name, but one of the things you had to do when you were a boss down there is you had to take all these congressional people on tours. And, okay, let's go on a tour, and I'll tell you, take you exactly where this is going to change your point of view. No, we don't want to do that. We just want to go to this checkpoint, yeah. uh, interview this person. And then we're, by the way, we're back on a plane at 2 o'clock. So, right. um, and unfortunately, that mentality migrates into what occurs in our policymakers' mind, and then I think eventually filters to the people. Having been there and worked there and lived there, it's a beautiful place with great people, but it is dangerous as hell. And right now, I think the way that we're trying to contain it um, is a kindergarten point of view. There are answers to this, and right. they're, not, they're not hard. And matter of fact, our government and the will of our people have done it in the past. It's just in the last several years, people haven't really paid attention to what the telltale warning signs are. And the cartels, I think, for us... Uh, or the flares, you know, that were sent up that said this is a changing environment and we have to change. And unfortunately, we haven't. So I think border by the numbers, like a little game. So if you guys want to play a little game, so we've got some educated people here. So let's do the northern border, okay. right? Our friends to the north. Let's not talk about the rocks there. Go ahead. We're not going to talk about <laughs> the rocks. But there are 13 states that touch Canada. Can you name any of them? And don't look. Detroit. I know we used to head over to Canada when we so Michigan. Michigan's one. Right. I'm going to knock that one off. You're done. Uh, Mr. Producer. <laughs> no, New York. I know New York with Niagara Falls. Okay, there's two. Um, ah. Well, here's some. Let, of, let's, 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 let's. Washington, North Dakota. Most of us say Washington, but Washington. in Missouri we say Washington, so Washington. that's fine. Uh, Montana is correct. Wyoming? No, no, Minnesota, Wyoming. look at this. Wisconsin? Uh, Wisconsin is not. Oh, they oh, just said North Dakota. North Dakota is correct. No, I'm cheating. That's all right. Any, well, give me another one. Come on. No. What's, what's Alaska? Alaska, great, great one. All right, so some of the other ones. Ohio. Yes. Joe didn't even know. I. I was gonna say that. Okay. I thought nobody would get Ohio. Hey, hey real quick, I'm gonna interrupt you. This is not a, uh, a, a regular production here. This is a uh, producer John production, and his assistant producer is Dave Miller, who's always a big fan of the show. There's no Huggy and there's no uh, producer Jack involved. So no, but they were doing the guessing back there, and so uh, that's nice good. guesses. Dave so here's the Ohio. real good here's, moves. You guys here's the sharp. tough ones. New Hampshire, that's a tough one. When I first did this, I didn't get that one. Vermont. All right. Maine is not, but we got two easy ones, Pennsylvania and Idaho. So those are the 13 that cross. It's just a tiny bit. There's up a narrow the strip that goes the up. Question yeah. is where's Pennsylvania's thing? At? We know where that is. That's a battleground state right now in the election. So we'll see what happens. All right. There's but, your quiz. So I think that uh, just by the numbers, right? So Jack said roughly 2,000 miles. It's 1,954 miles lengthwise. Now I looked that up. And got four separate numbers. Yeah. So that's hilarious. Oh, it's, I, I so think it always goes back and forth like that. This is, this is an average of those numbers. The really neat thing is there's 18 miles of our southern border that are in the Pacific Ocean. All right? Which is really cool. And I think that's important. There's 12 miles of our border that extends into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, I'm not going to get into the asteroid, but <laughs> Gulf of Mexico, that's an interesting thing. Right, Dinosaurs yeah, we'll 63 million years ago. A neat little thing also is the Rio Grande divides the U.S. and Mexico for almost 1,300 miles. So that's, that's a pretty and, and, and the Rio Grande, to put in perspective, it can be as wide as this table or it can be a mile across. Uh, um, and depending on the water flow, the right. rain, uh, it changes. So the egress for people to get into the United States changes with the weather and also where you are. It does. Um, and I just want to throw this out. This is a little known fact. While we kind of, because of what we're doing, Tommy, we're kind of going to concentrate, obviously, on the southern border. The northern border over the years mm -hmm. has been one of the top, if not the top, um, places for law enforcement to do 
espionage yes. and uh, foreign spies entering the country. So let's not discount that, no. um, but the mere volume is clearly... It's a different kind of... You know, right. It is. You more associate that with, like you said, espionage, and, Absolutely. but the other one's more associated with drug cartels. Absolutely. Right. So I, in Jack's point, that's a great point that we're, we could talk about a little bit later or some other time, but if you don't want to be caught crossing the border by surveillance, you come in through Idaho or Montana or you sneak in and... Uh, it's pretty intense. Just as lax? Just as lax some as of the it southern is. border? Some of it is. It's, it, I mean, it can be as desolate as the, exactly. as the southern border. But just so everybody understands, and I was involved in a couple of these things early on that we had information on uh, and from a Washington perspective. Um, there's a small satchel over here that producer John uses to carry stuff. In some cases, that's as large as needed for a dirty bomb. Right. So as we discount because of the mass movement from the southern border into the United States, we can never lose lose the fact that yep. the northern border can be just as dangerous. And, and I think it is as well. So a couple little more facts. One of the things that Jack talked about was the desolation on the border. So 62.5 miles north of the border and south is called the border region. So they consider that where people, if you live in that region, there's only about a million people that live in those regions. In the entire, yeah, it's, what you would call the border it's, region? It's pretty desolate in some areas. And I've been down to some entry cities, Del Rio and some other areas, where you look across the Rio Grande and it goes for miles. Yeah. So when these... When these migrants or these individuals that are coming here, that's a that's a tough trip. That's a that's not easy, and they walk most of it. So we hear a lot about the wall, right? You know, that was a big thing. That's still a big thing. What? So that's one way to do it. What other ways do they patrol? You know, and does a wall necessarily so, well, work? I think that's a really important point of view. Um, and to, to really illustrate, you got to understand the mentality of the cartels. First of all, they're a business entity, uh, a corporate like structure, and they're looking to make profit. So it is not in the business interest of the major cartels to cross high volume dope in desolate areas. It's too cost effective, and they can only do small amounts. So what do they do? They go to the Checkpoints, the points of entry. What's the advantage for the bad guys there? They can shoot 10 cars through, each with 15 kilos. Maybe we pick off two or three. Uh, the rest get through. You, you only got to bat 300 to get in the Hall of Fame in right. baseball. Um, and then the other important element is most of those, virtually all of the checkpoints, they converge to U.S. interstate systems. Right. So their ability to move the 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 dope or money or guns or whatever they're moving quickly or terrorists quickly up our interstate system is much more available so that's important now what do we do not to say that the wall is not an important deterrent for human smuggling because i believe it is but what we're missing uh on the other side of it is we just don't have the manpower or the technology to continue to do what we're doing uh, in the ports of entry to be effective. Uh, and that's what has to change. That is the swipe of a pen for, a, for Congress or the Senate. It can be taken care of right away. Yes. But we have to make sure people understand that that's crucial. Um, so for people to say, oh, they're, you know, my own thing with the wall was you, you build a 10 foot wall, a trafficker is going to get 11 foot ladder. That's just the way their mentality is. But the real, the real money in their pocket comes through our, our checkpoints. So I th they, I, they actually could, then I was going to ask that. Oh, so so yeah. the, 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 the large amount of fentanyl. Yes. <coughs> so here's and listen, cocaine comes through the checkpoints. Listen to this. Listen to this, this, uh, these numbers, these numbers are staggering. There's 47 active points of entry. And after NAFTA, because pre-NAFTA was, was about 40 or 50% less than about what I'm going to say, 300 million every year come in and out of the country legally to do business or commerce or whatever that may be. 90 million vehicles and 9 million tractor trailers. You think they can, they can hide well, they, a ton of dough? A couple of them get through? Yes. For everyone that gets found, 10 to 120. Well, and, and you have to remember that 
there are billions of dollars of legitimate commerce that cross that Correct. border every day. So where do we step on it? How do we try to fix it? It's Technology is available, and we have not invested in the infrastructure to make that change. So that's, Tommy, that's doable. I think so, too. And I testified in front of Congress, that's doable. So, so my take on, on the wall, and you, you brought up a point, it's $650 million in commerce a day. That's a lot of commerce. Yeah, but Joe, the illegal drug trafficking, we're estimating at $65 billion, billion. a year. So it's insane when this other nonsense is going on. But what I like about, so I agree with Jack. You build a 20-foot wall, you build a 21-foot, and I think one of the vice president candidates is talking about that right now as well, right? Yeah. But what I like about the wall is the wall gives you, and you, you build the wall five feet, I don't care. But what the wall gives you is technology, right? You can put electrical lines in the wall, you can put surveillance cameras, you can put all that other kind of stuff in the wall. And I think that's what nobody talks about, right? They just talk about people climbing over it. But that's not what the wall does. In my opinion, the wall gives you a platform to increase this technology, to see what is going on, even if nobody's I, there. That's a good I, point. I, 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 think that, I think you're right on, but I gotta take that a little bit further. The technology that we know works has been deployed for 10 or 15 years, and those are sensors in right. desolate areas that would show movement. Now, here's the problem. That works very effectively. We don't have the bodies to get to those Correct. areas to do anything. Right, so it would be an intelligence gathering thing until what Jack said, sign of a pen, let's get some bodies, let's figure Number this one, out. Number one, if we want to stop the movement of drugs, guns, money, both ways, south and north, and human trafficking, you got to invest in this, and this is technology off the shelf. No one's trying to figure this out, no. but it's going to take some money. And a congressman's not going to figure that out if he comes down on a government plane and spends two hours walking through right. the DEA or FBI office. Not now, so just so I, I mean, and you guys are telling me stuff that I'm dissecting here as we go, but so most of the drugs still come through the entry points. Absolutely. No question. And then the illegal immigrant problem that everybody talks about, you know, in Chicago, does that come more from the open border then? Not necessarily. No, I agree. Um, and that goes to the second major issue that could change. Because of the way our laws currently exist, the entrance requirements, whether it would be for political pro 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 uh, uh, prosecution in the country they're migrating through, um, is so delayed and so backlogged that we will grant them temporary temporary residency. Um, right now, I know all my buddies at the uh, uh, Border Patrol say, I think it's up to 40,000. What they refer to them, Tommy, as gotaways. Oh, gotaways are... What are gotaways? These are people who either l entered the country on false pretenses or just flat out badasses. Got away. We don't know where they are. So there's 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 a little bit added to that. So a gotaway means they caught you on surveillance. They caught a sensor. They know that you came in, but they have no. You never talked to anybody. They never put you and gave you your app just or whatever. Rolled on in. They just rolled on in and they. How many is that a day? It's uh, roughly. Let me get this number because I wrote gotaways. So I did it a couple different ways. 2010 to 2020, 1.4 million. That's 1.4 million people enter this country. We have no idea who they are. Right. Now, I'm not, this is not political for me. This is, I'm going to get into the terror side of this. That's what's scary to me. 2021, there was 388,000, roughly. In 2022, there was 606,000. And 2023, there was 670,000. So what do we got? We got 1.4 million, and we got another 1.7. So we're looking at about 3.5 million people in this country. We have no idea where they're at, no idea what their motives are, no idea what their political agenda is, no idea what mm -hmm. they are. Over half of those people came in in the last three years. Unfortunately. Which is, this, which is really the whole point, I think, a break. for why we have to do something. Um, this, is not, this is not going to get easier. Now, 